Okay. Um, I'm reading this. War and Peace. Uh, I'm reading this because I don't know how to read very well. And I want to learn how to read. Uh, so, my nephew got me this. Um, this is what it says. Ben, this is because I know you like to read. Reading gets rid of ignorance and sparks interest. And you should only be interested in things you don't know rather than things you know. I hope you enjoy the book and learn some things about war and peace. Yours truly. And, and he, he signed it, Kevin. Okay. War and Peace, Leo Tolstoy. Translated by Anthony Briggs with an afterword by Orlando Figs. Penguin Classics, an import of Penguin Books. Chronology. 17. Ooh, okay, All right, here we go. 1724. Piot Tolstoy, great 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 grandfather, given hereditary title of count by Star Tsar Peter the Great. 1821. Death of Prince Nikolai, Volosky, Tolstoy's grandfather. At Yanase Polna, you know, this is going to be really hard because I don't know their, how to pronounce these, these names. So I'm going to bastardize them a bit. Let's see if I can do this properly. All right, introduction. Although War and Peace... Sorry. I'll get there, I'll get there, I promise, I promise. All right, here we go. Although War and Peace has often been described as the greatest novel ever written, Tolstoy once claimed it wasn't a novel at all. Henry James, giving the title as Peace and War, called it a fluid pudding and included in it a list of large, loose, baggy monsters. By contrast, by contrast, it has also been compared to the Iliad in scope and technique. And Prince Dmitri Mursky is distinguished emigrely historian of Russian literature, called it the most important work in the whole of Russian classic fiction. Tolstoy's protestation that it wasn't a novel, had a particular purpose. He wanted his readers to expect something broader and deeper than the romances they were used to finding in fiction. There would be no single hero and heroine, no straightforward system of ex... ex no straightforward system of ex position, crisis and resolution, no orthodox ending. It was a book in which Tolstoy made up new rules as it expanded, a society novel that turned into a family story only to grow into a historical chronicle and a mighty epic that was underwritten by a deep interest in individual destinies and intimate human detail. It was a 15-year trench of human experience, 1805 to 1820. Fictional and real, located in Russia society in an age of critical importance for Europe as a whole. And Tolstoy made an unprecedented attempt to bring together the widest possible range of interests, personal, social, psychological, and historical. But most important is his instinctive skill 
as a teller of stories and creator of characters. La the lasting quality of War and Peace lies in its compelling narrative and fascinating people. Imag imagined and historical. Ah, I see. Yeah, cool. Right. Uh, perhaps Peace and War might have been a more appropriate title because only about a third of the action takes place on or near the battlefield. Anyone coming to this novel for the first time can be assured of one thing. You are going to enjoy some very good stories. But first, we need to sketch out we need to sketch in some background. Tolstoy begins his novel about th Tolstoy begins his novel by throwing an evening party to welcome his characters and in his readers Oh god damn it and his readers uh the year is 1805 and Napoleon aggressive actions especially the recent seizure of Joanna and Lucia seems likely to threaten Russian western borders <clears throat> The huge and bumbling Pierre Bienskov Hoff and, and the neat, self assured Prince Andrei Boloski are guests, and their maturation and misadventures will form the main interest of the novel. At first, the two young men have everything going for them. Pierre inherits a huge fortune and marries well. The efficient André will find success in all that he does as a landowner and soldier. But both of these gifted and fortunate men will make many mistakes, feel constantly unhappy with their course in their life, taking appallingly bad decisions and having to live with the consequences. The same applies to the leading female character, Natasha, whose progress from childhood to full maturity is so convincingly depicted that she has been described as certainly the most wonderful made character in any novel. The strength of war and peace is in weakness of its characters. In the weakness, god damn you, Ben. Uh, the novel... The novel is the novel is a detailed casebook of human inequality and uh, uh, the novel is a detailed casebook of human inadequacy and imperfection. So many avoidable errors are made that it will be a long time con contentment and equilibrium start to emerge. God, what the fuck did I just read? So many, avoidable, so many avoidable errors are made that so many avoidable errors are made that it will be a long time before the contentment and equi contentment and equilibrium start to emerge, and for some of the characters, new insights come too late. Oscar Wilde said that what made Russian writers' books so great is the pity that they put themselves in. God damn you, you just made that up. So great is the pity they put in them. There we go. They have seen life tackled. They have seen life, tackled it, and tried their best. And they know a truth that rarely declares itself, especially in stories that are meant for entertainment. It is this. Virtually everyone, even people of advantages or privileged circumstances, find the living of life a worrying and difficult business most of the time. The novel takes us in rich detail through all the seven ages of man, from the childhood to old age, and explores their difficulties, all of which are played out under the gathering shadow of death, the one certainty. As another Russian writer, Boris Pasternak, 
concluded in the novel Dr. Velenko, living life is not just a walk across a field. But there is more. Only a few... Only a few of the 500 characters in the novel pause to think about the complex and difficult process by which human lives evolve. But Pierre and André are never happier than when unhappily gnawing at the meaning, difficult choices, and hidden possibilities that may or may not underline human existence and the searching for clues to make better life and easier. God. Um, a series of vital questions is waiting for them and for the reader what and where is happiness how do you distinguish it from fun how is it possible to live on the sure and certain knowledge of death is the concept of God any help what are the roles of fate and luck in human existence how can a person find complete freedom? Are there any ultimate philosophical truths that we can all rely on? What, what should you do with a human life? Life and love. But Tolstoy knows that you cannot spend all your time philosophizing. Philosophizing. The sheer thrill of being alive and the excitement of surrendering to the moment and reveling in its pleasure are infectious, repeated in a series of set pieces. Sometimes the occasion is quite exquisite enough to be the high point of an individual's life. It's hard to imagine Count Yela Rostov ever being any happier than when she dances the little copper at home. Volume 1, Part 1, Chapter 17. Unless it is when he proposes a toast to General Bragadoshan, Bragarashan, 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 General Bragarashan, at the lavish dinner that he has put on at the English club with the money he cannot afford to spend. Volume th 2, Part 1, Chapter 3. For senior soldiers, there is a glorious opportunity to be noticed by the Emperor. Hence this obsequious, the obsequious behavior of an elderly general before the Tsar Alexander I. First volume, second part, third chapter and the suicidal rush to, into the river Valia by the Polish general, anxious to please Napoleon, which costs lives of 40 men, but wins him a medal. Even young Peter Rostov is borne away with the mindless raptures at the mere sight of the Tsar. By contrast, Almost all the younger characters find sublime happiness in falling in love, and at one point the entire Rostov family seems dizzy from it. Love was in the air at the Rostovs at this time, as it always is when there are very young and very charming girls about. Any young man arriving at their house and seeing those young girls' faces, so sensitive and always smiling, probably at their own good fortune, amid all the chasing and the scurrying and the hurrying, all their flourishly girlish chatter, so good-natured, open to everything, brimming with hope, and eventually equaling feverous singing and music-making, enjoying the same sensations of love sickness and impending bliss that the young Rostovs were themselves enjoying. <laughs> there are many occasions of, for tears of joy. Dancing is one such. For example, Natasha is an instinctive Russian dancing after the hunt is a reminder of her father's happy evening with Daniel Cooper. Her own unspeakable delight at her 
first ball whirling around with Prince Andre and Divinivol Denisov and Denisov. Amazing Mazuraka and Eolal Gels Ile Gels It is useful to emphasize such bliss, not least because Russian literature has a reputation for gloomy introspection, which is only partly deserved. It gives the novel the most unusual quality. Tolstoy's ability to lead us through disappointment, frustration, and tragedy without bitterness or cynicism. He declares against all odds that goodness of living. This is the spirit of the whole novel. You will see it at its best in Volume 2, Part 5, all 13 chapters. War and Peace, oh, Life and Death. War and Peace was written during one of the few periods in Leo Tolstoy's life when he had a sense of tranquility and purpose. Superlatives are needed to describe him. Superlatives are needed to describe him. A big, strong man with a formidable intellect, powerful emotions, and extraordinary qualities and defects that ran to the extremes. He lived a long life and left behind work that fills 90 large printed volumes, the biggest and richest individual contribution to the treasure house of the 19th century rotten Russian culture. I think we're almost there. No, we're really not. There's a translator's note. Okay, oh, well, I think we're almost there. We'll, we'll get past the introduction. Leo Nikolaevich Tolstoy was born in... 1828 to the Russian aristocracy at Yan Yasana Polyan, 130 miles south of Moscow. His parents died when he was young, but he and his siblings grew up happily, cocooned by family relatives. At the age of 16, he entered the University of Kazan, but failed by courses but failed his courses and returned to Yazanan, which he had just inherited. By then, age 19, he had contracted his first dose of venereal disease and continuing risk during the following years of debauchery and gambling in Moscow and Petersburg. Tolstoy's largely autobiographical childhood was accepted by the contemporaries in 1852, the first writing he had submitted for publication. Despite the, its modest aims and rather dry realism, it was popular and was followed by boyhood and youth. Even greater successes attended the three-part Sabastos in December and May in, in August. Oh, no, you see, I'm already done. I'm done, guys. All right. Well, that was up to part XVI. XVI. 16. Page 16 of the introduction. Whoop, whoop. <laughs>